It's one of the fastest growing markets worldwide. It's enjoyed by hundreds and millions of young people all over the world. And yet, those older than 40 probably have no idea of the success and popularity of what's become the next big thing in sports and entertainment. Of course, I'm talking about esports. Let's take a moment and talk about it. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Moment of Zen, a podcast about everything and nothing. I'm your host, as always, Jonathan Zen. Real quick, I just want to thank you all so much again for your support. And if you enjoy this podcast, remember to rate, comment, review, and subscribe. And with that out of the way, let's begin. So, esports, also known as electronic sports, it's taken the world by storm in recent years. It's growing bigger and faster by the minute and is expected to reach a viewership of about 303 million people with a revenue of about $1.5 billion by 2020. This is an expected 51% increase in viewership from 2017, where about 194 million people tuned in to some sort of esport event, and about nearly double the revenue from 2017, which topped about $696 million. For comparison, the NBA, or National Basketball Association, averaged about 1.84 million views per game in 2017. That's a total viewership of about 151 million viewers for the regular season. While I don't have the numbers for viewership during the playoffs, they are more often than not about double or triple that of the regular season. If you look at just the regular season numbers, however, esports viewership beats the NBA regular season viewership by about 40 million people. Just think about that. The NBA is the second most viewed sport in the US and is actually viewed less in 2017 than esports and I know I'm getting a little too ahead of myself here but let's backtrack a little bit I'll come back to this a little later Um, let's start at the beginning what exactly is esports I know I said earlier that the formal name of esports is electronic sports but that doesn't really mean anything basically what Esports is is competitive video gaming. If you're an older person like a Gen Xer or Baby Boomer, you're probably shaking your head right now and asking yourself, what the heck is this guy talking about? Competitive video gaming? That's not a real thing. And to that I say, you're wrong because it is a real thing. And it may very well be the future of competitive entertainment and sport if you're a millennial like myself or if you're a bit younger and are a gen zer the idea of competitive video gaming isn't a crazy or even a weird one chances are you probably grew up around some sort of video games and they are a completely normal part of your everyday life before i go any further i think we should take a look back at the beginnings of esports and hopefully try to bridge any sort of disconnect on the opinions and history of esports between the younger and older generations. So let's jump into our time machine and travel back to the 70s. People were wearing bright colors, hairstyles were a big old mess, young people weren't taking it from anybody, and the person next to you was probably high. So now let's take a trip to the tech capital of the United States when it was still mostly farmland and trees. 
October 1972, at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, the earliest known video game competition was held. The game that was being played was a game called Space War. And for those who are like myself, who are too young to know what the heck Space War was, well, it was an incredibly popular game developed in 1962, and it involved two players controlling a spaceship, or what is supposed to be a spaceship. If you look at the actual gameplay, it's more like two triangles. <laughs> Anyways, the goal of the game was to shoot down the opposing player's ship. If you haven't, you should definitely check it out when you get the chance. Um, but Stanford students were invited to play the game in a tournament at school where the winner, Mr. Bruce Baumgart, won the grand prize of a year's subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. What a great prize. The earliest commercially endorsed or backed video game tournament was held by Atari in 1980 for the game Space Invaders. It attracted more than 10,000 participants, and as video games became much more accessible to people in the 1980s with much more affordable home consoles, as well as a huge boom in the arcade industry, more and more people began playing video games as a hobby. The majority of the games during this time were primarily single-player games that focused on the player trying to get the highest score possible. Examples of these types of games are Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Tetris, or what we consider nowadays classic arcade games. Naturally, with people aiming to try to get the best score possible, competition arose. I'm sure many of you who've been to an arcade have seen the high scores list with like 5 million points on Pac-Man or something. And that's exactly what happened in the early 80s. People were drawn to the idea of trying to beat everyone else's score in a video game. And in 1982, the first televised competitive game show called Starcade debuted and it featured contestants that attempted to beat each other's high scores on different arcade games. Though the show only lasted about two years, it did manage to air a total of 133 episodes. So that goes to show you that people were somewhat interested in watching others play video games. Of course, this interest only continued to grow when the 90s came around. In the 90s, the competitive aspect of gaming truly began to take hold because of two big reasons. The first is the infrastructure and advancement of gaming technology that allowed for more multiplayer. What I mean by this is that games were increasingly able to be played consistently by two or more players simultaneously. This is important because having two or more players play together at the same time meant that it was possible for head-to-head -head competition in real time. And this leads into the second biggest reason for the surge of competitive gaming during the 90s. And that is a little known game called Street Fighter 2. A few things I want to clear up before you hardcore gamers spam me with your correction. Yes, I know Street Fighter wasn't the first and only fighting game out there in the 90s. And I know there are a lot of other fighting games that were arguably as popular or even more popular than Street Fighter, but Street Fighter was the first fighting game that really brought that entire genre into the forefront of gaming. And for those of you who don't know, Street Fighter is an, an arcade fighting game where you select a character to fight against a programmed AI or another player. And the reason why Street Fighter is so important is it kicked off what I considered to be the first true iteration of competitive gaming. Fighting games are games where the entire gameplay is 
you pitting your gaming skills against another player and to me it's the sort of most purest form of competitive video gaming in the 80s yeah there was competitive video games but they were sort of indirect competition since those players were competing for a score rather than against each other so moving along the next massive wave of competitive gaming began around the late 90s and early 2000s and that's when esports kind of really begins to take its foothold and starts taking massive strides to the forefront of entertainment the massive wave of competitive gaming was the result of this tiny small fad that so many experts at the time thought would never last um man what was it again oh man i i know it. it's uh oh it's just, it's a thing called the internet home internet access really became much more affordable and accessible to the general public around the late 90s and early 2000s and with the internet you not only get online games, but you also get to play games against people from across the world. More and more gaming tournaments were being held for different games as well as being televised. The esports scene in the early 2000s were really dominated by what I consider um, first person shooters like Counter Strike and Halo. A large boost in esports' notoriety came during the early 2000s in South Korea. South Korea was really quick to adopt esports as a form of sport. The Korean Esports Association was formed as part of the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism in 2000 to promote and regulate esports in Korea. From there, Esports became regularly televised in South Korea with 24-hour networks dedicated to gaming channels. Televised esports in the West sporadically appeared and disappeared from the airwaves. And in the U.S., ESPN, which was broadcasting the NFL, began broadcasting its sister video game, Madden NFL, from 2005 to 2008 and in the UK xleague.tv began broadcasting esports competitions from 2007 to 2009 and it's really hard to say which genre of games dominated this decade since there were multiple genres of games that came up during this decade that really helped shape the esports scene of the 2000s. The true rise of esports came within, I'd say, the past five years. Online streaming services like Twitch.tv helped to broadcast a variety of different esports competitions to the world. In 2013, Twitch recorded 4.5 million views in a single day with an average viewer watch time of about two hours. Again, to put this into perspective and comparing this to the NBA, sorry, I'm a huge basketball fan. The average NBA game lasts about two and a half hours. And in 2017, each NBA game averaged about only two million views per game. I know there's some caveats to this number, but 4.5 million views in a day is a pretty big deal. And in tandem to the growing online viewership of esports, there's also a growing demand for physical viewership of these competitions. Again, in 2013, during the Season 3 League of Legends World Championships, they held the competition in Los Angeles at the Staples Center. And they sold out an entire 
11,000 capacity arena in just one hour. This is the same building that my team, the Los Angeles Lakers, play in on a nightly basis. In 2015, the first esports dedicated arena opened in Santa Ana in Orange County, California. And this year, Luxor Las Vegas will be opening its own dedicated esports arena on the Las Vegas Strip with more planned in the next decade. So that's the sort of brief history of esports up until today. I know I've been using the term esports pretty loosely. Again, I want to clarify that esports does not necessarily refer to just one game, like the word sport doesn't refer to just one sport. There are many different types and genres of games in the esports world. And the most popular of these genres and games in no particular order are real-time strategy or RTS, first-person shooter or FPS, fighting, and multiplayer online battle arena or MOBA. And to all the non-gamers out there, I know it sounds like I just threw out a bunch of words at you, but don't worry, each one is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go over each one of them with you right now. So real-time strategy. It's basically what the name suggests. It's a strategy game played in real time. So what's a strategy game? Strategy games are games where the outcome of the game is highly dependent on the decision-making skills of the players. Probably the most well-known example of a strategy game is chess. But unlike chess, which is played turn by turn, where one player makes a move and then the next player makes their move, a real-time strategy game is played in real time and players are constantly making moves instead of having to wait for their opponents. Think of it like a sort of simulated war game. And in war, both sides make their moves simultaneously, and the winner is the side that outsmarts the other side, assuming that both armies are about the same size and are about similarly equipped. And the most popular games in this genre are games like StarCraft and WarCraft. Next, we have next we have first-person shooter or FPS. This is pretty simple. In this genre, you control a character in the first person, and you are armed typically with a weapon, which normally is a gun of some sort. And the goal is to kill your opponent before they kill you. Depending on the game, there could be extra objectives besides just killing your opponent. But in general, the goal is to basically kill your opponent. This can be, this can be played either one-on-one, -on -one, but more commonly it's played in a team. Usually teams of five players. The popularity of this genre has been fading a little bit in recent years, but it's still one of the most popular esports genres out there. And the most popular games in this genre are Counter-Strike Global Offensive and Overwatch. So, fighting games. I also kind of briefly talked about this earlier. These games mostly involve players controlling characters that engage in close combat with one another. There's not really too much to explain about this genre, and again, I mentioned before the most popular game in this genre is probably Street Fighter. Last but certainly not least are MOBAs or multiplayer online battle arenas. These games are a bit harder to explain, but in general, they can be considered a sort of subgenre of real-time strategy, where the objective is to 
destroy or capture the opposing team's base. Typically teams consist of 5 players on each side and each player chooses a character to play based on a pool of available characters unique to whatever game that they're playing. And all of the available characters to choose from will usually have their own special ability unique to just that character. And players will choose those characters based on their role or position on the team. If you compare this to traditional sports and again to reference basketball, each player on the team has a different role. For example, the point guard's main responsibility is to handle the ball and make plays for his teammates. His job is different from what the center or the forward's jobs are. And the same idea applies to MOBAs. Each player on the team will have a different role like support, defense, also known as tanks in, in the gaming world, or damage dealing. Teams typically will need to work together to strategize how to use their character's unique abilities to counter their opponents and their character's abilities in order to capture the opposing team's base. As of today, this genre is arguably the most popular esports genre with games like League of Legends and Dota 2 taking top spots in the MOBA genre. And before I go on, I do want to acknowledge that RTS, FPS, fighting, and MOBA games aren't the only genres of esports. Just like how football, basketball, baseball, and hockey aren't the only sports on TV. These are just the most popular genres, at least in North America. A few other genres worth mentioning are Battle Royale, like Fortnite, um, card games like Hearthstone, and puzzle games. So now that you have a basic understanding of what the esports landscape is like, it's time to ask the million dollar and soon to be billion dollar question, why are esports so popular? It's hard to say. I don't really play video games myself, but I know a lot of people around my age group that do. So my take on this is going to be purely based on my own experiences and observations. To me, I think the main reason for the popularity of esports in recent years probably has to do with the fact that young people like myself basically grew up playing or being around video games. So how does this translate into the rise of esports? Well, think about it. How do people get into traditional sports? I was born in the early 90s, which, as I talked about earlier with the history of the esports, it was when gaming really started to pick up. I think the first sort of competitive game that I played was Pokemon. I remember how, I remember how much fun it was to try to build my team of Pokemon to play against my older brother. And of course, being the younger brother, I always lost to him, but it was fun. And I know a lot of friends and people I met in high school and in college and at work who are really into esports, who share very similar experiences growing up. As I grew older, however, I stopped playing as much video games, but many people I know continued to play video games as they grew older. They grew up playing video games nearly their entire lives, so it's understandable that they have a much deeper connection and affinity to gaming than I do, which may explain why they enjoy esports so much. For the even younger generation, Gen Z, they've grown up in a time where gaming is ubiquitous, especially with Things like mobile gaming and online video platforms like YouTube and Twitch. The other reason I think esports' popularity has grown in recent years is its accessibility. 
It's really easy to get into gaming. All you really need is a decent computer and internet connection, which in most developed countries in 2018, the majority of households already have. Next is the games. Well, for the most part, these games are available worldwide and you can download or buy them almost everywhere. There's also a lot of free games to play like League of Legends where you can just download the game on your computer and play it for free. The games that do require you to buy them aren't terribly expensive and generally cost no more than $60 USD. Also, for gaming, you really don't need to have a specific physique like you would need for traditional sports. For example, I'm 5 foot 8 or about 172 centimeters, so that means I virtually have no chance to make it in the NBA where the average player is about 6 7 or 2 meters. I know there are exceptions to the height rule, but in general, genetics play a much bigger role in determining whether or not you make it in a certain physical sport or not. Extremely high levels of skill can help compensate for that lack of physique, but even then, you're still probably at a major disadvantage. This isn't a problem in esports, though. You can be as tall, short, built, or out of shape as you want. Pretty much anyone can participate. You just need to hone your skills in whichever game you're playing, and you too can be a pro gamer one day. And the last comment I want to make about the accessibility of esports is, for the lack of better words, it's accessible for people. Again, I want to talk about the importance of video game streaming sites like Twitch. Anyone can join Twitch and stream themselves playing video games. And on Twitch, there's this amazing feature called a live chat where, where spectators can directly interact with the players playing online without ever having met the person in real life. This means you can watch your favorite esports athlete play in real time and interact with them as they play. And a lot of times these professional gamers would give out tips on how to improve. And the people watching, they can also see how the much more skilled player plays from his or her perspective. This not only helps people get better at the game, it also builds a sense of community in the gaming world. Think about how much better you'd be at your sport if you watch your favorite pro athlete practice and give tips while he or she is practicing. And that's my take on the rising popularity of esports. I know there's a lot more to talk about in terms of esports, but I don't really have the time to go over everything today. Uh, maybe I'll revisit this topic sometime in the future, but I want to end this on talking about the future of esports. Like I said in the beginning of the podcast, esports are projected to hit over 300 million viewers and one and a half billion dollars in revenue by 2020. It won't even surprise me if the actual numbers exceed these projected numbers as it always has in the past. A lot of companies have already picked up on the esports phenomenon and have begun creating their own teams. Even traditional sports teams and retired athletes have claimed a stake in esports. The recent NBA champions, the Golden State Warriors, they have their own League of Legends sponsored team. Retired NBA players like Shaquille O'Neal and Rick Fox also have part ownership in esports teams. Even though the majority of these companies and owners have a generational disconnect from esports, they, like many others, are following the money. And I think over time, when millennials get older and we're the ones running and owning the teams, we'll probably have much more than just 
a monetary investment in esports. Esports athletes can apply for P1 visas, which is normally given to athletes of foreign countries to play in a U.S. sports league. Colleges and universities are also developing their own esports programs, and there have been a few scholarships given out to students to play in a college esports league, similar to what you would expect from a college basketball or football prospect. There's even talk about creating separate Olympics just for esports, and to me, that's the ultimate validation of these players as legitimate athletes or just being legitimate in general. Attitudes about esports have slowly changed over time. Um, a few years ago, I can't tell you how many countless journalists and late night talk show hosts badmouth esports players about being these sort of stereotypical nerds that live in their parents' basements. That's far from the truth. Frankly, it's a bit insulting and blatantly ignorant of what esports is. This attitude, however, has changed in recent years to be that of more positive view, and it's likely influenced by the amount of money that esports has been generating in these in the past few years. And I'm sure we'll see a complete 180 shift in the next decade or so. I think in the next 10 years, kids will grow up watching certain esports teams and and develop a loyalty towards that team, like how many people develop loyalties to their own favorite traditional sports teams. Teams like Cloud9, Fnatic, Team Liquid, and, and others will be as ubiquitous as the most famous sports teams in the world, like the Los Angeles Lakers, Real Madrid, or the New York Yankees. But, you know, I could just be completely wrong. This could just be a fad like cryptocurrency, and it's possible that eventually esports will peak and fall. I really don't know. I'm not an expert. And I'm definitely not inside the esports circle, so I really can't say for certain what's going to happen in the future. But as for now, it's looking like this could be the future of sports in the world. So let's embrace it. Let's just sit back, relax, and game on. With that being said, Thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been your moment of Zen. Until next time, take care and stay fresh. See ya!